So we just saw Revolution by Jack O'Connell, uh, featuring Louise Malone, who is here with us from New Mexico. Are you, is that where you live now? All right. Well, so. <laughs> 20-year-old from Scottsdale, and as it turns out, you were cast into this film. It wasn't as if Jack went around to Haight-Ashbury looking around Hippie Hill trying to find the person to focus on. How did it come about that you were cast? I was coming up the stairs. Can you hear me? Um, I was coming up the stairs in the Avalon, and a girl handed me a piece of paper that said, girl needed for lead part in movie, no experience necessary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for some reason, I knew that I was going to do this. I just knew. And I went and talked to him, sat down with Jack O'Connell, and, the, and they had me talk into a microphone to see if my voice was OK, and, uh, and took some photographs and called me back the next day and said, you're our girl. Wow. So, and it was awesome. I mean, it was. I didn't always get to say what I wanted to say. Quite often I had to say things that uh, was the director's agenda more than mine. But um, I did have a blast. It was chosen to go to three European film festivals that year. And I got to go. And, and so it was a wonderful opportunity. I met fabulous people. And a lot of people I love are here right now. And uh, so it's awesome. It's, I love this. This is great. So even at the Avalon Ballroom, you knew it was going to be a film about the Haight-Ashbury and about the hippies? Not at first, no. Ah, okay. So when I called the phone number, they, uh, then they explained to me what they were doing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, looking back on it now, do you feel you were or even back then when you first saw it, were you fairly portrayed? Well, <laughs> everyone had their point of view, you know, everyone had their own experience. And um, it was a bit of my experience and a bit of a lot of other people's point of view. And um, there were parts of it I would have loved to have taken out or shortened. Um, and there were things that I really wished I could say that wound up on the cutting room floor. But. Oh, uh-huh. Well, there are outtakes, you know, yeah. somewhere, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jean, uh, Dr. Hip, Dr. Schoenfeld, uh, since you were not in the film, as far as I know, you might have been in the crowd. Maybe you were, were you in the nude scene there with the Anne <laughs> yeah. an Halpern dancers, <laughs> Country Joe. Uh, how did you feel about this movie, having now seen it? Well, it's the first time I've seen this movie. But I was here during that time. I thought it was a, you know, an excellent portrayal of the times and the way people felt and what they were doing. Were there revelations for you? You were there. But for me, for example, seeing exactly how that communal flat or apartment or house looked and with a dozen people jammed in there, uh, had you seen those scenes during the 60s? Oh, yes. Yes, I'd been, uh, you know, within many uh, homes and communes. And, you know, I was at the Morning Star Ranch uh -huh, uh -huh. and spent some time there. And yes, it was an accurate depiction of what was going on during that time. I wish they'd put captions and told the names of the people that were in the film. Right. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, the real shortcoming there in terms of the authorities, as well as the known people. We all, well, us San Franciscans, know Herb Cain and Willie Brown, but the, the police chief, uh, the health officer, Dr. Ellis D. Sox, <laughs> a wonderful name for those times and for his job, <laughs> uh, the health director of San Francisco. It would have been nice to have known uh, who they were exactly, what their authority was. Uh, Diane, uh, you're in the film. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> You're in the concert scene, a park, and how did that happen? Uh, well, Ambrose uh, Red Moon Hollingsworth was our uh, manager, and he got us the gig up there on, uh, that was Mount Tam, and um, the amphitheater, and it was, it was great. It was just great. Uh, because just the vibe of the whole scene, and for us uh, to be the the only woman band in the area at that time, uh, 
was just a perfect opportunity for us to just express ourselves and what we wanted to do. And, um, you know, we followed Quicksilver around a lot, too, because uh, uh -huh. uh, Ambrose also managed him at first before Ron Pulte. And um, during that time, we opened for the Quicksilver all the time. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And we were kind of, we are there, but we are almost invisible during that time. Like, a lot of people never heard of us. Um, but we were there, <laughs> and, um, and you're still here. And I'm still here. In case we run and short we on, are also in here. case we run short on time, you just had a, a recent honor from the board of supervisors, and you are at work, uh, have been now for a couple of years, I know, on a new CD. Correct. That is correct. Oh, great. After all these years, it's been 50 years. <laughs> Since 1967, I'm from Mount Tam, and uh, we finally got a record deal. <laughs> finally. We're finally acknowledged for the time that we did during that uh, era. Yeah. And, an, uh, an overnight success. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you're talking about time, you know, it doesn't matter. You know? Right. And you just get there. But mm -hmm. um, so uh, like it's going to be you know, like a three CD album coming out, uh, you know, spring or summer of next year. Yeah. And we were trying to make it for this year, but you can't push creativity mm -hmm. and you have to let it just develop and grow. And it's it's an amazing, uh, it's going to be amazing. Just did they, <laughs> looking forward to did, it. Did the women in Ace of Cups uh, get speaking parts? Was there ever any plan on you doing more than playing uh, at a Mount Tam? Uh, not speaking parts, uh -huh. no. Okay. Um, I just wonder how, how Jack handled the uh, various people he ran into, whether it was band members, people on the streets, people at the med clinic, uh, uh, hired cast members, whether he created scenes. Now, I want you to try to climb a tree, you know. Or I yeah. Want you, he actually would tell that you. That happened, yeah. Because you didn't seem like the most gung-ho tree climber I've ever seen. <laughs> well, I wasn't... <laughs> The best tree climber, period. <laughs> what else did he make you do that you felt, oh man, this is this ain't me? Like lying on the grass, giggling? Um, and, no, that was real. <laughs> <laughs> that was real. Yeah. Are, they, are these like co-gigglers here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well done. Well, Marlene and Rebecca and I all lived in Petaluma. There were seven of us. And uh, we'd been friends. That was 68. Uh -huh. But we all met on Haight Street at the corner of Haight and Cole. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you're hired from a flyer, and you're plopped into the scene, although you've been part of the scene anyway, right? Because mm -hmm. you visited, you had friends there. So w was there a lot of manufacturing of those scenes? Are you skipping around, be, uh, running into the arms of friends or whatever, hanging out with them? Uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, but you know what they say about memory in the 60s, but if I remember <laughs> correctly, that was one where, you know, it was his guidance as director, run up, but, you know, I was happy to see them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Dr. Jean, I should learn a title for you, but Dr. Schoenfeld, what was your own interaction in the Haight-Ashbury uh, 50 years ago? Well, I had uh, just returned from uh, doing research in Gabon, in West Africa. I was, I was there to do a research project on hypertension in Gabon, but I became more interested in the use there of a, a drug called uh, Ibogaine, mm. uh, which comes from the Iboga root. And I was very uh, interested. I, I had taken LSD once before going there, so naturally interested in psychedelics. Uh, and after I left Gabon, I went to uh, France because uh, the French were using small quantities of ibogaine combined with vitamins as a pickup tonic because, you know, small quantities of psychedelics act as a stimulant. We see this currently today with microdosing of LSD. Well, I, had a, I got a quantity from the laboratory in, uh, in Paris, and I brought that back to the United States, and I found that there was a young doctor named David Smith who was doing experiments at the University of California with laboratory animals with psychoactive drugs. So I, I joined him, and we were 
doing experiments on, on rats with uh, amphetamines and uh, mescaline. And then there was some human experimentation that happened with uh, Ibogaine. And during that time, uh, David formed the idea of having the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, uh, of combining, there were little clinics that had been set up by the diggers. And he had the idea of combining it into one clinic. Founded it in June 50 years ago. Yes. Yes, all right. It was 50 years ago in this past June. Yes. And I had the idea of writing about the effects of drugs. And uh, this was because, as I say, there was some human experimentation that went on. And, and that is how the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic began. And that's how the Dr. Hip columns began. Originally in the Berkeley Barb. Yes, it right. started, my column started in the Berkeley Barb. Yes. And then after a couple of years, it was picked up by the San Francisco Chronicle and then uh, syndicated by United Press Syndicate. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, the Berkeley Barb was being hawked by one young woman in yes. the movie. Yes, I, I, noticed, I noticed that. <laughs> so now, Louise, was that for real? Or were oh, you? that was for real. Yeah, well, <laughs> they set it up. They wanted me to sell them, but mm -hmm. I did that anyhow. That was you a did. good way to make <laughs> right. some money. Well, so you were paid for your work uh, in the movie, yes. but you still needed to uh, earn more money to be able to afford oatmeal and... <laughs> you know bars. <laughs> uh, Twinkies. Diane, how real, uh, you know, you hear the branding of the music of that time as, uh, well, firstly, San Francisco sound, and then the psychedelic music and acid rock. And as I've gone through the years writing about the scene, uh, more and more the band members say, yeah, we were always uh, on acid when we were on stage. You know, you couldn't go up there sometimes without being uh, high. How was that for the Ace of Cups and yourself? I think only one time I think it was high <laughs> on acid, and it was strange. <laughs> Could you tell how it impacted your drumming and your, your rhythm and your timing? Uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly what happened or how it went, but everybody said it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember looking at my snare drum and that, um, you know, on the bottom head, it was clear and the top, you, you can kind of see through it. And as I was looking through it, I think, I had x-ray vision. <laughs> it was like, whoa, you know, but... Uh, but you know, at least there were no part. monsters crawling out of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Some <laughs> mm -hmm. people experienced that. But that was the only time, uh, you know, I just wanted to be playing and be you know, right. know what's going on a little bit, and that taking acid would be, I loved it when you were in the woods or in the nature, yes. and then everything then is really mellow when you're in, excuse me, when you're on the street and you see a car coming, uh, it was like a monster, you know, <laughs> these big lights and this whole face on it, All everything right. uh, that wasn't organic, really you noticed that mm -hmm. it was out of place. And of Wires course we, and, you know. Yeah. And we, have, and we have Louise, the acid head here. Uh, <laughs> at one point, didn't you say something about having had 23 trips? Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. Actually, at that time, if that was early on. And that was real. <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting going. Well, yeah, where we met, uh, there, we were producing, they were producing pure LSD on vitamin C tabs. Mm -hmm. Did you keep track of your trips? How no. did you know you had uh, 23 <laughs> under your belt? I, I guessed. Uh, Hollywood <laughs> in San Francisco. Well, <laughs> but I did get to say what I wanted. So that When I sold the newspapers, that was me acting up, you know, being silly. <laughs> yeah, it, it made it more fun and more real, you know. Right. Speaking of real, I don't remember seeing that many nude people. Uh, yeah, that movies. was that was Jack's thing. <laughs> <laughs> now Jack, uh, last right, no Jack Manny there. Uh, Jack uh, was twenty years older than you, and I'm sure most of the people in the, mm -hmm. in the film. Did that impact the way the film was made? Was he to a degree? Mm -hmm. Yes, and he came out of New York, and he had worked with. 
uh, Fellini and Antonioni, and um, he had that vision at that time, and there was uh, a lot of the, you know, sexual revolution and, and all of that, and he felt it was a part of art, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that a beautiful form was a beautiful form. That was his vision. So let's spend 15 minutes on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not an hour and a half, <laughs> but that's okay. And mostly uh, focusing on the women, of course. Yes, <laughs> all right. Uh, it, there was an update of this film in 1986 uh, in which you appeared looking at yourself 20 years before and mm -hmm. talking about what you had gone through. And one of the things I, I heard clearest was your kind of uh, re-evaluation of uh, drug usage and what drugs did for you and also probably to you. Can you restate some of that, how you feel now? As a mother especially? Yeah. Um, well, I think the drugs are much more dangerous now. And I was, I was really protected. Um, in a lot of ways in my life. And uh, I, I kind of have a picture of myself as this girl standing on the edge of a cliff, leaning out as far as she can go with all these angels or fairies hanging onto her skirts. Mm. And that's kind of like how my life was then. And I, I met wonderful people and we took care of each other. Um, but after years of meditation, and um, and doing yoga and things like that, I I felt like um, it would have been better to have had the discipline beforehand to uh, so that the vision was not out of the blue. In other words, I think it's very valuable, and I think it's. Um, I think it's a real experience, but I also think that preparation and and discipline can it will take you to that place anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I also feel like it made us very very open to the energies around us. And I think that if you were around negative energy, you could have a negative trip. And I was fortunate to be around amazing positive people. And um, and so I never had a bad trip. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like that weren't, weren't wasn't LSD a precursor to some of the um, the psychiatric drugs they're using now? Well, like Prozac and no, no, no. okay, then no, not not related. Get that. <laughs> but now, finally, after we've lost more than fifty years, finally. Uh, there are being studies allowed using LSD and psilocybin, and uh, we can expect that they will be used in uh, psychiatry more mm -hmm. in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Finally, well, there was after so losing, much research done. after losing all, yes, before, yeah, before, before the ban, there was a lot of research that found LSD uh, could be useful in treating alcoholism and, yeah. mm -hmm. and drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Hmm? In Canada? Canada. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, d Dr. Schoenfeld, did you feel the film was uh, uh, pretty accurate in portraying what the scene was like overall in terms of the good and the not so good and even the evil? You were part of a circle that provided support services to a lot of the uh, people, right? They were runaways or residents through the Huckleberry House, yeah. uh, an invaluable resource, the free medical clinic, uh, the good work of the diggers and other organizations uh, in the community. Uh, did you feel the film reflect all of that and also said, besides talking to the politicians and the police, that there was more, more to it than just peace and love and, and good vibes? There, there was more. There was a downside. Uh, most of which occurred after the film was made. Yes. Mm -hmm. After that period, yes, it was a downside. I mean, after all, there was a, it was a time when uh, one could walk down the street and you could recognize people who were, who were like you for a time that long hair, or perhaps the way they dressed. Then after a time, it became a, a fad and a person with long hair may not at all have been like you, it might have been Charles Manson, you know, which <laughs> actually happened. So, you know, there was that, that period of time, but then it, it degenerated 
and uh, a lot of it was associated with uh, more harmful drugs. Mm -hmm. That was exactly like right. like heroin and, and uh, the the abuse of amphetamines. Sure, I mean because almost all drugs can be useful in s proper circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it's taken a long time for us to learn that, and we're, we're still learning about it. Mm -hmm. Diane, you probably saw the film shortly after it was released, because you were partly because you were in it. Have you seen it many times over the years, and now watching it again, do you have feelings about the impact on you? Yeah, it's been, uh, it was just two other times, and they were, it was a long time ago, so. Um, uh, I get some of them mixed up. There, uh, there's been a, a few films about the '60s and and oh, which yes. ones. And this one, yeah, this one, uh, this one is my favorite actually. And uh, during that time, uh, uh, this film portrayed pretty much what was happening during that time. And um, what was the question? Well, <laughs> but, but the point you make too, the, over the years we've seen so many documentaries uh, t on TV networks as well as feature releases, and they tend to be a pastiche of found footage. And they grab mm -hmm. a, a CBS documentary here and an interview here and a, a home movie of the uh, Bean or the Trips Festival. It's not the same as having a crew consistently following a group of people uh, at that time uh, with those bands. Uh, playing for this film, so it's much more intact. I was just uh, wondering if, looking at it again today, you felt uh, you learned anything new about the impact of that summer on yourself as a person. Oh, anything new, I would say, uh, just how it actually impacted uh, the generation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at that time, and uh, how you could reinvent yourself during that time. And, and now that we're in this place now, I see we're still there. Yes. You know, we're still there and we can still reinvent ourselves mm -hmm. and, and change things and, and uh, the revolution within is where it starts. And yes. that's what I've learned uh, from there to here and looking back uh -huh. and that that's where it comes from. Yes. Uh, the revolution within yourself and making your change for the better good for all people. Yes. So Louise, um, you are a, uh, a most, uh, a, a lovely presence on the screen. The uh, cameras uh, absolutely embraced you. And uh, it being a time of uh, free love, I'm wondering, were there a lot of guys and perhaps gals coming after you while during this time of the shooting? Well, no. Well, I was very busy. I mean, I was I was there with the uh, with the crew, and I was learning. Was it like a daily thing then, where you yes. would meet and and what today we'll shoot in the park, today we'll shoot. We'll uh, go up to the, Morningside, or uh -huh. you know. Yeah. So you had no time for permissiveness uh, to. Uh, no, and I was, I was incredibly naive. I was very young, and and. Um, Half the time, if someone was coming on to me, I had no idea. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but it was really the truth. Well, you were on acid, probably. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah. I think uh, by the magic of uh, timing, we have a few minutes. If you have a question or two, are you open for questions? Oh, sure. All right. Anybody want to ask a question? Let's take the gentleman there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what makes me a good grandmother. I was there at the time fully, and I love what you said about the transformation spiritually that took place. To me, that was the tip of the crossroads moment that had the old guard terrified. Yes. Um, well, I, I somehow came into this life being a spiritual being, and I, it wasn't formed by, uh, by church or the things, you know, my parents, but I always had a, an interest in it, and um, as I 
as I grew, when I went through the 60s, and when I went through the Haight-Ashbury, I was fortunate that I was around a lot of people. I would go to um, the Krishna temple for breakfast, and and I would uh, I would sit in meditations, go to Stephen's classes. Um, it was just it it was something that was important to me. That in healing, and I became a nurse, and um, so. Uh, from there, you know, I, I I love the roots of every religion. I I believe in disorganized religion. I really do, <laughs> and I um, and I see the I can worship with anyone, you know. I can jump over the Beltane fire. I can, you know, meditate. I can pray. Mm. You had your hand up. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Yes. To me, it, what, it, to me, the important thing that was happening there was that we were looking around and seeing that there were people who were being treated differently, and there were people who were being overlooked. And so I think we went to embrace everyone, just to learn. We went to learn. We went to school. And um, I think that the part of it was the war. Um, you know, we marched, I marched for everything because it was important. Gay rights came out of it. Women's liberation came out of it. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the integration uh, continued. Um, I get a little worried about seeing it come back around again today. Whoa. And that, and and that very much concerns me. Uh, Louise, when did you uh, revert back to your uh, name, Louise? I mean, that is, how long did today last? Oh well, some people tease me, but I call myself Yesterday <laughs> Malone now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so. going to call you that at the beginning. <laughs> oh, I'd have loved Gentlemen. it. <laughs> yes, right. So when, but but I know you became a mom uh, within a year or two after the I film. I really, I I used the name today purposely, partly because I loved it, and and one of the people in the film gave me the name. Don did, and I really loved the idea that it meant be here now, and uh, and I also went with that because if it turned out to be a terrible film, and I hated it. <laughs> Could I could be Louise still, <laughs> but Louie, you know, people call me Louie. Uh, any other, one last question? Yes, ma'am. The, 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 the one, that's right, you. So um, you were in the time, did you take LSD? Did I? No, or Ben? Me. Um, only once. Was that and bad, I don't huh? remember it. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Bad. <laughs> so you were there. <laughs> I should have taken much more, actually, given the, jo given the jobs I had. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Be careful. What? Yes. Right. No, he is in the house. All right. One more. One more. Right here, sir. Go ahead. What Grant? <laughs> No. Uh, I was dancing with you. <laughs> it took only 50 years to learn that. Yes. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much to Diane, to Jean, and to Louise. Thanks to you. And the library welcomes you now to uh, partake of snacks and also check out the brand new exhibit all about the summer of love. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.